Hello, Civ fans, and welcome back for this week's live stream of Civilization VI Gathering Storm. My name is Sarah Darney. I'm your host today, and I am joined in studio by Ed Beach, lead designer, and Jason Johnson, our art director. Um, so, JJ, it's actually your first time on the stream, so yes, can you just give a little introduction to what you do, who you are? Sure. I'm JJ, I'm the art director for Gathering Storm. I was also the art director for the last expansion, Rise and Fall. And I started here at Firaxis on Brave New World. And this year will mark, yeah, 25 years from me working in the video game industry. Ooh. We've got one. a veteran on our hands. Somewhat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, I just wanted to give Jason a shout out because his team has just done amazing work this last year. They were so you know, enthralled with kind of where we're going with the game this year and some of the things we wanted to introduce. Thanks. And so, you know, I, I knew we were going to have something for Volcanoes, but I had no idea that they were going to end up the way they ended up. And then just everything just kind of built on that. And we uh, got lots of things done way above where I was expecting them to be. So Awesome. Thanks. Yep. Yeah, you were actually the lead, um, like, environment artist for Base Game. Yes, correct? it was. Yes. Yeah. Wow. So it was really, like, cool for me just to kind of see the world come alive um, with Base Civ 6, but then also, like, the addition, um, so many additions in Gathering Storm, you know, with the volcanoes, the floodplains, yeah, all that. Cool. Yeah. yeah. What's your favorite? What's your favorite visualization in there? Floodplains and volcanoes, they're really close. Yeah. You know, they're both super, super cool. Nice. Um, all right, so today we are going to be playing as the Maori. Um, this is a first-time Civ, right? Sort of. Half and half. Okay. <laughs> but we're going to say yes. Okay. Um, right. So we had Polynesia and Civ Five, and they were very popular. Everyone liked the fact that, wow, I can just immediately take off and go across the ocean if I want to. So that's you know gave them a just a really unique play style right mm -hmm. out of the gate. So we wanted to bring that back, but... We, we kind of knew that we had mixed and matched from different parts of Polynesia, right. and we wanted to drill down that, you know, the more we can drill down and really embrace a specific culture, like, the better we feel like we're doing it, truly representing who they are and, and you know, giving their culture and their leader and, and their history a voice. Yeah. Um, so we felt like we did that this time with the Maori. We, we dug nice and deep so that we, we you know, between... The, the mythology of Coupe and his discovering mm -hmm. of um, New Zealand, which probably did happen at some level, but, you know, exactly right. how that's, you know, um, worked into the history is, is sort of a little bit of an unknown. But <laughs> once we realized how many different groups, um, how many of the, the tribes or the Iwis at, um, within New Zealand um, embraced Coupe as sort of their, their founding father, we decided he was a great leader for us, and that's the way we wanted to go. Awesome. Um, so a lot of his, like, his story, the story of Coupe and the story of the Maori kind of um, plays into their gameplay. Do you want to talk just a little bit about that before we jump in the game? Absolutely. And um, so I feel like Polynesian Civ Five was fun, mm -hmm. but sometimes you'd, you'd be placed in a uh, starting position that was good to begin with. Or, you know, maybe it had a lot of coastline. They were, they were concerned with lots of coastlines. So they wanted to put their Moai statues up. Um, so sometimes you just stayed where you were. And I didn't get around to using their ocean-going capabilities right away. Yeah. Right. And I felt like that was cool, but I wasn't actually always using, you know, the, the thing that made them really, really interesting. Um, and once I heard Coupe's story, that just sort of captivated me. It was like, how do you pick up everything that you've, you know, ha uh, own and your whole village and just put them onto water so canoes and <laughs> yeah. just trust that you're going to find a great place to, you know, establish your, your kingdom somewhere across the water. And so I just felt like that was such a good story. I wanted Civ players to live that story. Mm -hmm. So if they could start the game in the middle of the ocean, not be able to see land in any direction, and just try to trust that they're going to find something good enough that they're going to be able to not only, you know, establish a foothold there, but flourish and become a dominant civilization. That's just a really cool game story, and yeah. we wanted to tell that, and so that's exactly how they start. So I think that that is actually a really good segue into what we want to do today. Um, we want to do things a little bit different, uh, and so let's jump into the game. Um, this is a game that none of us have seen yet. Um, we created the save, but we haven't actually played it. Um, so we want to hear from chat. Uh, jump in and kind of tell us which way you want us to go. We'll do 
a very scientific approach to this, um, and we'll just choose north or south or whatever direction for each move. And just to <laughs> give a little bit of context here, um, people have been looking at the Maori's abilities and saying, wow, that sieve looks very, very powerful. You know, how, oh how, how are they going to possibly be balanced with the other sieves in yeah, the game? Yeah, good point. And so I wanted to explain a little bit about how this start works. So the, the cool thing about this start is we've actually made this a, a generic capability and... Let's go and west. West, okay, we're going west to begin with. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt. No, that's fine, that's a big... I'm having trouble big, keeping up. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and we're not finding anything to the west. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, and we, you know, one other thing that, that we should ask mm -hmm. them, for right now we've kept our units together. But oh, yeah, that's true. The, the other thing that we can do, is, when you're playing as a Maori use, you can decide, I'm, I'm playing risky, right, and I'll Carl. send my settler off one way, but my uh, warrior is going to maybe explore somewhere else. I always Let's split go south. So when you play... You typically separate or go together? I, I separate them okay. because... I do too. I okay. think if you land carefully, you can establish your, your city without the escort, and then you get a lot more information if you're um, <laughs> moving them independently. Oh, we no, it's land. Tundra. <laughs> and the other way. Okay, so the key thing here is, um, I think this is a six-player game, mm -hmm. and so normally when we do map generation for a six-player game... We take the map and we divide it into six large segments that are all nice, big, fertile areas to settle in. And everyone gets one of those pre-allocated to them, so they have got a lot of space to develop their empire. Right, yeah. But in this particular case, that's not how it works. Once you introduce a ocean start sieve like the Maori, um, immediately it says, oh, I don't need to allocate space for them on the land. I'm going to divide the land only into five pieces. Mm -hmm. So everyone else gets a better start. They get more fertility, more land pre-allocated to them. They're spread apart further. And our poor Maori player is going to have to reach land and decide, hey, I'm going to shoehorn in here. <laughs> don't bot, don't yeah. mind me, but I am carving this off is, a little uh, part of your land. land <laughs> and... Um, that, you know, just the, the fact that that's the way the map's divided up mm -hmm. and they don't get anything allocated to them, they have got to be a little bit more powerful than the average sieve just to be able to make the inroads they need to to, you know, keep them viable. So you end up probably, I, I end up when I play them, I sort of borrow from two or three other players' lands. I, I don't, typically I, I, I want more space than I can carve out just on the edge of one person's yeah. pre-allocated lands. But, um, you know, sometimes, you know, across a sea, I can find two different lands that both will support me. Um, but I definitely have to have that extra oomph. Yeah, for sure. To get going. Um, now, we're going to definitely have to get into that a little more. Um, but we've got land here. And we have an opponent. And we have an opponent. <laughs> um, all right. So where are we going to settle into this land? I'm seeing a lot of people saying um, river. So we had a little river back. There are two rivers. Yeah, I think there was one there, that's and there's a very one up one. north, more towards Norway. Um, how, how that this isn't <laughs> forward very, subtle Norway. Very far north of the tundra, <laughs> is it? Um, no, I think it's it's a pretty it's a bit, okay. yeah. All right, so I yeah I think right where Carl's got our settler now yep. is certainly worth consideration. Chad is saying southern river. Up up, up. easy. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Nor no. Norway likes that spot Ooh. too. Oh my gosh. You're way braver than I am leaving your settler back there. If we get attacked <laughs> and lose a settler. Okay, so yeah. <laughs> we have I mean, we have four movement points. We can land on that grassland tile and establish a city there in the first turn. I will have an amber resource. I think we should go ahead and do that. All right. I don't know if Chad agrees with me, but... Ooh, or maybe we wait and we ooh. settle near the giant's causeway that we just found. But that's a barbarian land, so that's dangerous as well. So that, anyways, this is why I love playing the Maori. I do they're, too. they're absolutely my favorite to play. You get those real good decisions right off the bat. Right. You know, it's a lot and, of fun. All right, Carl made a, made a choice for us. So we're settling right here. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> one key ability they have 
because obviously we're, we're behind in terms of land right now. Mm -hmm. We need to get extra land. So that's why we gave them a culture bomb ability was because, you know, now that they've established uh, an outpost, we wanted to not have them worry about housing, so we gave them a little extra housing in the palace. Right. We didn't want them to have to worry about um, how far behind they were in terms of tile growth, so we give them a culture bomb off the fishing boats to get some extra tiles. So if we could get, for instance, um, a boat out to that jade tile, we should be able to expand our territory there. I should have called it out before Carl settled, but we have a, a new unique settler unit for the, the embarked state out in the water, as mm -hmm. well as the um, embarked units in general have a three canoes that we made custom for yeah. the set. Well, hopefully we'll re-embark another settler. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If, we're, if we only have one city all <laughs> yeah. game, yeah. No. we're not going to be doing very well. No, that's no, true. One, that's true. <laughs> once we get the next one, we'll zoom in on that and um, give it a nice look because uh, really the aesthetic of the Maori is one of my favorites Me in the too. game. It's, it's so striking and different. Yeah, it's like very graphic too like mm -hmm. with some of their carvings. I was really, really excited when Ed settled on the Maori for this. Yeah, so how did that process work? I know that we, we worked a little bit with um, some outside assistance. Yes, yes, we had some connections in 2K Australia mm -hmm. that we contacted them for some, some more connection to some New Zealand folks and for Coupe's tattoos, for instance, we used a um, Tom Moko artist in New Ooh. Zealand named Katz and let him just design exactly what he thought Coupe would have yeah. worn. Let's so. pull that up on the screen right now, um, make sure that everyone has a good chance to see it. Because um, it, it is a very important part of um, the Maori culture. Absolutely. It's awesome that we were able to get, you know, a very authentic piece done for our Coupe. Yeah, in their culture, it's only they can really do the tattoos, and yeah. we weren't going to do it unless we had an official Maori artist do it. And nice. We actually gave him no art direction whatsoever and just let him do it, so. Yeah, it's really, really cool. It adds I a lot it. of character to yeah. it. <laughs> I love it. I think he's so cool. All right, so um, while we're here, uh, we've got a lot of people asking, what is Coupe's agenda? Okay, so Coupe's agenda, I, I did send this out on Twitter, but we didn't sort of initially, you know, <laughs> officially announce it. Um, it comes from a Maori word. Mm -hmm. There's a, it's a compound word, so it's kiataki, which means guardian, and they add tonga at the end of that, so kiataki tonga. Kiataki tonga. Yes, okay. and that means guardianship. And that really is a um, sort of a... Uh, embodiment of of the Maori belief system that the, it's not necessarily that the Maori own land or possess land or feel like they um, you know have have a kingdom that is theirs. They mm -hmm. feel like the land is sort is sort of something more that they um, you know they need to protect. Yeah. And and maybe the land owns them a little bit. Okay. There's actually I mean, there there was a um, very. Uh, well-publicized um, legal case in New Zealand recently where a river in New Zealand was given actual rights in courts. Oh, really? Because of the fact that's that really that's sort of just part of the way their belief system operates. Yeah. So I don't think you can find anyone, a any culture or peoples that has any higher level of respect for you know the environment yeah. and nature than that. Mm -hmm. And so that was why they're a perfect fit for Gathering Storm, while we wanted to work that into the leader agenda, you know, we wanted to find somebody who was going to, you know, get unhappy with you if you were playing right. and, you know, not being um, conscious of what was happening to the planet. Mm -hmm. Now, it sounds like it's similar to the environmentalist agenda. So the way it works is I looked at the environmentalist agenda that mm -hmm. we had before and I decided it wasn't sufficient for Gathering Storm. Okay. It needed to be sort of upgraded for that. So things like what your carbon emissions level are, things like that didn't exist before. So I took okay. a lot of the factors that we had already had in the environmentalist agenda. So what level of deforestation the trees have and whether you've created any national parks, whether you've mm -hmm. planted any new um, trees or forests, uh, those are all still there, but then I added some more detail to it, including things like looking at the carbon emissions. And now there still is the environmentalist random agenda and they both work the same way so that okay. you kind of can understand that if I'm, if there's another leader in the game, um, maybe, um, who also has the environmentalist agenda and coupes in your game, you'll know that, okay, there are two people that I can keep either happy or angry with me based on 
my actions. Awesome. Um, now, I do want to take this moment just real quick to uh, remind chat if uh, you are on Twitch and you're watching the stream and you have questions for us, there is a separate room you can go to with questions for devs. This room has slow chat turned on, so we won't miss them. Cool. <laughs> um, so feel free to like keep heckling Carl in the other one. He's watching. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and then jump into questions for devs if you have anything um, that you want us to answer, and we can try our best to get to it. Um, OK, so people are asking about Norway. And he is in our game. Mm -hmm. So Norway so, or um, Maori? We actually have an interesting collection of leaders in the game. <laughs> Somehow, <Yeah>. randomly, <laughs> <laughs> we have all the naval powers in this game. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> <laughs> and all the colonial empires that had something to do with New Zealand <laughs> as well. So, um, yeah, I feel like all three of these, um, oh, actually all four now, uh, naval powers that we have in here have a different uh, strength to them. And so, yes, Norway is similar to the Maori in that they can get across the oceans mm -hmm. earlier than everyone else can. But by the same token, Norway is all about dominating the oceans. Norway has a unique naval unit. Um, and so their longships, um, and plus they have an ability that lets them build melee naval units faster throughout yeah. the entire game. So Norway always has that ability to, you know, we're going to be powerful in the seas. We can project, project power on the seas. The seas are actually way more important in Gathering Storm than they've ever been. The trade route, um, trade routes are all getting enhanced gold from trading over the water now. With canals, you can connect up a lot more things. You can get naval units to places you couldn't get them before. That's a lot of fun. And so Norway having that ability to always build navies quickly, always have powerful naval forces around, that's very different than the, what the, the Maori are good at. The Maori are great at getting to land masses other people can't get to and getting an established presence there. So, right. so like they somehow they found New Zealand, and New Zealand was this wonderful, fertile land um, that with great natural beauty and resources and everything else, and as far as we know, no one else was there. Yeah. So, you know, it, it is sort of tucked away in um, a part of the world that, you know, is, is a little bit harder to get to. So that's kind of the specialty we see for the Maori. The Maori are really good at um, getting the places that kind of have been left behind by everybody else. Um, so, and then he also think about think about what's going on with Norway in this game here. Norway has land that was pre-allocated to them in the map, and it's a it's a nice fertile area. We're hanging on the edge of Norway's yeah. land yeah. sheet here. So you know, trying to compare them directly, I you know I don't think you really can. Um, so it, it's been an interesting journey with us for the Maori. We spent probably most of this year balancing, rebalancing, mm -hmm. retuning, rebalancing some more right. with the Maori. That's it's the the sieve that we've absolutely spent the most time on. Yeah, they've got some interesting setbacks um, in addition to like their unique uh, ways of playing. So why why were those picked? Like, what is that? Well, just what to make the whole idea of the ocean start work, mm -hmm. we had to give them a few benefits, like still accumulating culture and science um, during those turns. We, we didn't want you to feel like you had to get on land right away yeah. and immediately settle, because you might just pick an area that is suboptimal. You won't have scouted out. The scouting's the really fun part of it. So we wanted to say, hey, we're going to give you some time. And the best way we could do that was by letting you still accumulate some science and culture right from the start of the game. Now, it's a little bit odd because the culture you accumulate goes right towards code of laws mm -hmm. because that's just sort of the way the tree is set up. There's right. only one option there. So we know that's what you want to put it into. So, you, so that one's pre-selected for you. But we didn't uh, want to pre-select the technology that you go towards because you don't know where you're going to be. You might be in an area with all sorts of quarries and mines right. and you need mining. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Or you might be in an area where it's the, you know, the plantation, ir irrigation yeah. side of the tree that you need. So we want to still let you accumulate science while you're sailing around, mm -hmm. but you don't have to decide what to lock it into right away. Um, so, um, yeah, there, there are more parts of their ability that you know, we can talk about now or yeah, maybe a little bit Yeah, yeah, no, I, I think that okay. um, there's so, some really interesting gameplay there. Right, so the other thing that we wanted them to do is we really wanted to focus on this idea that they are good stewards of the environment mm -hmm. 
And so they're going to be a sieve that we, we give you a big incentive not to chop things down, not right. to harvest resources. Now, so, they cannot harvest, right. correct? So resource harvesting, harvesting is absolutely prohibited for okay. them. Um, and they can't even put a new district down on top of a bonus resource okay. like everyone else can. So that's a little bit restrictive in terms mm -hmm. of their pla placement. But that is different than chopping right. trees and rainforests. So trees, okay. rainforests, marsh, <laughs> they can still chop those okay. normally. Um, but what we've set up is if you look at their bonuses, especially when they get their unique amphitheater, the, the Mirai yeah. online, mm -hmm. they want to keep as many... Um, features within their cities as possible. And so the passable feature that is listed there as, as getting the bonus once the more, um, they, they've kind of got everything in place, that's, you know, any tile with a woods or rainforest or marsh that you're allowed to move through. There are some features that are impassable. Mm -hmm. um, uh, volcanoes are actually considered features right now. Okay. Uh, um, when we added them, for uh, Gathering Storm, they, they became features. Um, so, you know, we didn't want you to think you'd get bonuses for those, but basically right. anywhere you can move and, and allocate citizens to work and those kind of things, right. they get the bonuses. Okay. Um, Carl's got the new settler oh, perfect. unit up there now. All right, yeah, he is a really, really beautiful unit. He's um, one of my favorites. Yeah. I mean, most of the units for this culture are some of my favorite things to see, so. You were telling me yesterday that just the way this um, the settler was designed is kind of based on like making sure it has the components of the land settler. Yeah, he's got some some little items and things that are on the land settler that are actually on the little his boat as well too. That's so cool. Yeah, That's I love great. all the little details that the team gets to like put in. Yeah, they had a lot of fun with it. Yeah, I, I actually saw this morning. I think it was this morning. There was um, there was a post online and it was someone and they were like, "What's wrong with my?" Um, my pasture, and it had all the animals outside, and everyone was like, "Oh, that means it's not being worked." Yeah, I was like, "Yep, that's that comes one from of that whole things. show and not tell that we really wanted to do when we started on vanilla and continued through this. That's why we, when they were talking weather and eruptions, we yeah. really wanted to show them in the, a really cool way instead of just being in a menu somewhere right. or something. So right, it adds to it, and it kind of. For me, anyway, it just it makes me feel like this very powerful entity, seeing this whole world at yeah. my fingertips come to life. It's incredible. All right, so we have. So some. Carl is created a second settler. Which direction did he send him? He's okay. I guess that's towards the Giant's Causeway. Would be a natural place to settle him. Yep, yeah, right up there. Looks like Norway's got a settler going that direction yeah. as well. So <laughs> it's probably gonna win. <laughs> uh, he, he can get there first, but we're gonna be split between two different locations, and Norway's gonna have a nice, sort of dominant central position. So, well, we'll see what happens. Yeah, I and mean, this is the great and powerful Carl <laughs> we've got over here. And... <laughs> this is so, a. Really yeah, now, interesting see, land mass. This yeah, is, is where the Maori is, <laughs> is strong in terms of being able to find other things on the mm -hmm. map that other people can't get to. So you pick up a couple extra goody huts like Carl has shown here. Uh, when you need Aeroscore, you can go ahead and circumnavigate the globe and get that Aeroscore from that. You can also get Aeroscore from finding all the civs in the game. Um, there's Aeroscore for being the first civilization to find all the civs in the game. So. Cool. That is one of the things I like about them is anytime um, you're like, I really need a golden age now. I was just mm -hmm. in a dark age. I want to go for that heroic age. Yeah. You know, those kind of things, it's very easy to time all them with the Maori. So, um, you know, the, those are some of the advantages you have. It's just trying to figure out where you're going to have that nice strong base on the map. That's always a challenge. I like them because to me, one of the most fun parts is exploring the map of my scout, and I immediately get to explore so much more. With so. Yeah. Um, all right, so Ed, here's a question for you. This is kind of a strategic question. Okay. A few people have called out that they think that the Maori might run into a lot of problems with loyalty. What do you think? Absolutely. And that's... Um, <laughs> <laughs> Going to be a challenge. <laughs> it is a challenge. Um, both in Carl's particular uh, game here and in general. Mm -hmm. um, and we have not given them any bonuses in that regard. So that's sort of one more factor that needs to be considered. Yeah. 
Um, and you need to think, that's why you have to think about the ages very carefully. Right. That's why the fact that you can time your golden ages just when you need them mm -hmm. is an important consideration. So there, there are several layers to playing the Maori. I um, have played them probably four or five significant games so yeah. far. And it, that's because the, the first couple games you play with them are, are definitely a challenge because there are things that you might not have considered going in that you have to, um, you know, sort of have that experience having played them before. Right, of course. So when you play the Maori, do you, I mean, do you have your cities very spread out like this, or do you cluster them up more? Or? I tend to look for places where there's like one body of water and mm. I can um, settle all around that body of water. So at least that, if I need to reinforce from one area to the other, I can just embark my army and get them from one side of that body of water to the other. Um, I think that's sort of working out for us here in this game, but it's a little odd having Norway sort of right in between our two <laughs> spots. It's okay. I, I have a lot of faith in Carl. I say this so much to put a lot of pressure on him. Yeah, good. <laughs> now, do we even check what difficulty we're on or uh, what This one is on King. Okay, and what climate setting? Climate's on three. Okay. Um, it's a little bit turned down from where we've had the climate. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I wanted to kind of do something that wasn't quite as... Um, pressure packed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, I feel like the last, the last couple of streams have had just so much um, with the environment going on. Right. Um, but I wanted to pull it back a little bit. Did he get his second city yet? I missed it. No. Okay. All right. See, we're about to. Okay, cool. And... Um, so you were telling me the other day about your Maori challenge game. Right. And I think that is one of the most interesting things so. I've heard. <laughs> this expansion. So I decided um, <laughs> that once I got a good Maori game going, mm -hmm. a start where I felt like um, I was going to be competitive, and I played this on Emperor, so it wasn't an easy game, but I just had, um, what, I, what I ended up doing was I ended up establishing myself on two different land masses with water in between them. Okay. And on one of the land masses, boy, it was a challenge, because there was Greece, Persia, and Russia. <laughs> all near me, and I could fit in two cities, and then they were all like telling me I'd settled too close. Yeah, yeah. Of so that was super. I challenging. think we just got some of that. <laughs> well, what, what I did was, I timed it so I had my Toa unique unit come online, and I got very lucky in that the, those three powers all went to war with each other. Oh. And so the Greece and Russian armies went to attack Persia, mm. and. Persia asked for help, and uh -huh. I said, okay, I'll help you. And I attacked Greece, and the Greek army was gone. <laughs> so I took the Greek capital and another city, <laughs> and all of a sudden I had a, a nice empire, and luckily the Greek army couldn't, they were mad at me for the rest of the game, and I had you know grievances with them and everything, but I had a strong enough base that I decided this is my good Maori start. Finally, this game I feel like I'm gonna be able to win. So this all happened up, you know, medieval, that mm -hmm. kind of period. I hadn't gotten to the industrial area yet. And I said, going into the industrial area, I'm going to challenge myself. I'm going to try to win this game without emitting any carbon. Oh, so cool. I'm going a completely carbon neutral <laughs> victory path here. Um, and uh, so I went for the culture <laughs> victory. And culture victory is a little bit of a challenge with the Maui because they don't yeah. get great writers. So they're a little right. slow on the tourism. But once you get to flight, people want to come visit um, you know, they're wonderful lands. You know, maybe they're going to be movies filmed there. Oh, we've got a Ooh. hurricane. Okay, Ooh. let's go focus on nice. that for a bit. So anyways, I was able to catch up, and I did win my culture victory. Really? Without nice. Without any carbon. There's an extra story there that if we have time, I'll, I'll get to. Oh, my God. That, that is... way nice. <laughs> I mean, I guess I should expect it from the lead designer of the game, but I'm like, why... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I'm a little sad we didn't put that in as an achievement. Yeah, it would have been a cool really good one. In, but the achievement yeah. sort of had to be figured out earlier. Um, so at the moment, that's not an achievement, but everyone else can try uh, with any of the civs to, to win that way. It's fun. All right, so I think this is the first time we've seen a hurricane Up in the game. Up close, at least. Up close is yeah. It? Oh, great. Yeah, we haven't had them on so the streams we wanna... before. Um, let's talk about hurricanes. What's going on there? 
Okay, so there are four different kinds of storms that have been added in the Gathering Storm expansion. Um, so they um, arise in different parts of the map, mm -hmm. and which storm it is is based on what terrain sort of has been chosen for that storm to develop in. So any storm that develops at sea is considered a hurricane. We have dust storms that develop from deserts. We have... Those are my favorite. I don't know. I kind of like the blizzards. Yeah, they're, they're cool too. Um, so the, you get blizzards as well, um, developing from tundra and snow, and then tornadoes from mm -hmm. grasslands and plains. And the, they're different sizes based on what type they are. The hurricanes, since they travel so much over water, are definitely the largest storms. Right. Um, and then based on the, the, sort of the way they behave in the real world, s dust storms do a lot of moving for, you know, fertile soils and depositing them in different places. Mm -hmm. Hurricanes bring significant rains. So we, we have both of them adding some fertility where they go across. All four storms will do damage. Yeah. Um, the tornadoes are the only ones that sort of don't really help anybody at, at all. Um, but the interesting thing about them is they're, they're sort of the most compact. Um, yeah. So they right. typically do a little bit less damage. And uh, the storms are set up so that it's you don't kind of get super unlucky and I keep getting hammered by storms over and over again. <laughs> we have a whole system where we keep track of where every storm has risen. Yeah. And um, we try to n have new storms crop up in different areas of the map where they haven't been before. Um, storms will get more frequent as the global temperature mm -hmm. changes. So that as the planet yeah. warms up, you'll get more of them. And um, kind of the other thing to, to keep in mind is we also have droughts that also are spread around the map the same way as storms are, to, just to try to make sure that, um, you know, the, the, the storms don't crop up at the same place and we have uh, some randomization to how they move. They do right. move according to the correct prevailing winds for whether you're in the northern or the southern hemisphere and where you are in terms of latitudes and meridians and all those kind of things. Uh, but there's enough randomness to it that nothing's too predictable there. So that storm, it looks like it didn't quite get to our city, but did it do anything to us? Um, well, we should look at the climate screen because that gives okay. us a nice log of what happened with all the storms that have transpired in the game. These are all the storms that we have seen in the revealed territory. And the good thing about the Maori is they mm -hmm. usually revealed a lot of territory. Um, so that was... A hurricane. All the okay. hurricanes get hurricane names. Cool. Um, we pull from the citizen name list, so we figure out which sieve was closest to the hurricane or storm when it started. Oh, I like that. And yeah. we pull a name from from that list. So yeah, they're they're way mm -hmm. ahead of their time in terms of meteorology. Our, our civilization. <laughs> but, oh well, yeah. you know, the, <laughs> they just know that in the future we're going to have named storms, and so. <laughs> Um, you can see on the effect column how many tiles got extra fertility added to them. Um, and it looks like there was no damage done by that hurricane. And since it was Great. that one seemed to mostly be at sea, um, it, it didn't have a lot of chances to drop extra fertility. But there will okay. be two tiles if we go tile by tile, we turn on tile yields that we could find that um, we can figure out have been enhanced by that okay, hurricane cool. going past. And apparently there were some floods too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we met, I'm not sure if we got um, the location of, of Victoria's capital, we might have. And so the Thames River, yep, is the, oh, one, right. the, the yep. flooding. So, yeah, again, it's giving us information about sieves that we've met or rivers that we've seen. Um, is there a single size of hurricane or that can change? Um, each of the storms have two different sizes. Okay. The river flooding, there are three levels of. The volcanoes, there are three levels of. Okay. The natural wonder volcanoes, that's, each of those is sort of a case-by-case -case mm -hmm. special um, setup. And we put all this in easily moddable data. Oh, nice. So Great. modders want to go nuts, and we want to have just super destructive world, or mm -hmm. um, they want to add effects to additional natural wonders, or all sorts of things. Uh, that's all going to be possible. You have an active Absolutely. volcano there now, too. Oh, right up north? Mm-hmm. Right All by right. our city. Yeah, let's zoom oh, in on that good. guy. <laughs> All right, well, maybe it will be fine. Or maybe yeah. it won't. Who knows? Oh, we'll hit Norway. Yeah, wow. I don't think I noticed exactly how close <laughs> we are to Norway. <laughs> but we've got a nice, nice little barrier of uh, mountains there, so we should be okay. 
Oh, All right. Circumnavigate. So we have gotten the error score. Yay. So are we still ancient error here? Uh, no, we're classical. Okay. So, so that's why, yeah, our score has reset. We got a good chance of maybe going for the golden age this time. So I have a question about the the Maori. Um, there are certain civs that tend to be more early game focused, some that are more later mid game focused. Where do they excel the most? I think it's probably late oh. because that's okay. when their culture really kicks in. That mm -hmm. that's sort of when they're gonna. I think they can play catch up a little bit yeah. in terms of like the tourism game late in the game. Now it's not when it, their unique unit is. Right. The Pa Fortress isn't very. So I, I, they're they're sort of a, a sieve that I wouldn't really pin to sort any part of the game. They just have different phases of what they should be doing. Beginning, it's finding a home and hanging on. So we, that's why their fortress, the Pa Fortress um, yeah. unique uh, improvement is so important. And the fact that getting their unique unit there is, is important. But I feel like once they're ashore and they've um, figured out which lands they can work between and they have made contact with all the civilizations, then they start to play catch up. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I think that's why ultimately I feel like it's later in the game that they're going to catch up and pass people. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of how my, the, the game I played with the... Interesting. Um, so it's not necessarily what you would expect. No, no, not at all. Um, I think we have a new city-state on here, don't we? Did you see one? We can look at our list of city-states. Yeah, let's pull that up. We're all like, oh, I can't. Yeah. See? <laughs> Enhance. Yeah. There we yeah. go. <laughs> um, yeah, this one here. A few people were asking about. Okay, and so if we look at their um, suzerain bonus, their unique bonus is um, they get to um, have cheaper purchasing with gold for uh, land units and support units. And uh, the support units, um, you know, th that that includes um, the the supply convoy. We added mm -hmm. more of those with rise and fall. So that's definitely, you know, just purchasing units um, more cheaply, and that's based on the encampment buildings they have. I think so. Um, I, an encourage a city state that'll encourage you to to build up your encampments. Nice. Uh, that's the other nice thing about the Maori is sometimes you'll make contact with city states that other people haven't found yet. So you oh, can become yeah, suzerain true. of them uh, without a lot of competition. So Ooh. in general, that's sort of a key element to playing them is think about what you, you're aware of that everyone else hasn't found yet and, and build on those advantages. Nice. I do appreciate that insight into things. Oh, so we don't usually get to hear the music in the studio here, but I'm <laughs> loving this right yeah. now. Um, the music for all of the Civ games um, is absolutely <coughs> beautiful, but I'm I'm super stoked about the Maori track. Really, all all of it, obviously, because that's what I've been saying the whole time. <laughs> it, it's, it's just so different. And it has everything so, about it. Yeah, much choral work worked yeah. into it, so it definitely has a different feel to everything else. Uh, it, it reminds me a little bit of the Zulu track mm -hmm. from Rise yeah. and Fall, where there was a lot of different choral things worked in. So mm -hmm. that oh, and was that my one favorite in Rise and Fall. So. That one had my favorite modern too. Just the way that it changed through time was really, really cool. All right, so. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about Coupe, the leader in mm -hmm. game. Um, he has some of the most interesting animations. Yeah. And like all of our leaders are beautifully animated, um, but it's based on the Haka dances, correct? Yes. yes our, um, the animator that worked on that one, Grant, spent a lot of time watching lots of videos and collecting videos and then actually learning these dances mm -hmm. in our studio so he could capture a video reference of himself doing these things. So, and Which we hopefully have saved somewhere course. that I can see. Of course. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'll send this to you after this. <laughs> yeah, they're incredible. But uh, yeah, hopefully, you know, we'll have him in previous or more streams so we can see a lot of his animations yeah. that are coming through. But 
they're really incredible. And he just decided to put lots and lots of time into it yeah. on his own. And it shows. Yeah, it's, they're really great. And so in the game, we just met Matthias. And Matthias nice. we met last week. Did you? And mm -hmm. so that's going to be our pattern here, is once we've met somebody mm -hmm. in terms of having a first look video and Put try them in the next play, one. they'll be in the subsequent games. So that's great. It's Harold and uh, Vicky here will start to fade away, <laughs> and we won't, we won't see them as often. Oh, we have another hurricane, don't we? Yeah. This is the larger that's size. That's the big one, yeah. yeah. I think this is a, the major Oh, one. yeah, that's... This is, we have Category 4 and Category 5 hurricanes. Okay. So this is a Category 5 hurricane. Um, so. Oh, no. Uh, the scout's right yes. in there. <laughs> and hurricanes do damage <laughs> units at sea, including Aww. our poor scout. So you do get an indication both on the climate screen and from the notification about which direction the storm is traveling. Mm -hmm. So you can head your uh, units appropriately. This one's heading southwest, so it might not do too much more damage to us, but uh, that's one of the things with storms. At least you, your units, yeah. which are subject to damage, typically can avoid it. Oh, Carl's moving close enough; it could take a turn that way, though. Yeah, that's something you know, I even talked about was just the fact of running away from hurricanes could be a lot of fun. Yeah. All right, we've got. Oh, I, I haven't had this happen a lot, but I just love the idea of a hurricane can come, it can sink your naval unit, and then later in the game you find that shipwreck, yeah. and the archaeology, archaeologist yeah. unveils Aww. it. So it's a little sad. It's a little but morbid. Yeah, it's, it's, it's cool, little morbid. though. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's, that kind of yeah. thing happening in your world is super cool. So one thing I wanted to touch on before we got too far into mm -hmm. the stream days, there have been a lot of questions online about um, you know, chopping and harvesting yeah. terms as sort of, sort of as strategies. Okay, And yeah. the fact that, you know, is um, the Maori going to be just a sieve that loses out in power compared to everyone else because you can't harvest? And uh, mm -hmm. so I think we cleared up the can they harvest, right. can they chop question. But one kind of key thing that I wanted to make sure that all our fans knew about was there have been changes to the way that production from chops and harvests get allocated. Yes. And so all along in Civ 6, there has been a bit of a sort of pro move that our players have been aware of, where if you have a bunch of modifiers stacked up, mm -hmm. especially through policy cards, you can go ahead and use that as the perfect time to grab extra production. And yeah. that like plus 50%, plus 100% modifier all of a sudden gets applied entirely to what you're do getting from the chop. You combine that with some of our governors and other things, and you could get massive productions. And that kind of production overflow technique was something that our players were definitely taking advantage of. And we have finally fixed that. Good. <laughs> and it's not just for, for Gathering Storm, mm -hmm. but it also applies to the base game in Rise and Fall. So players who love that strategy <laughs> should get it out of their system <laughs> in the next two months because it's not going to be around there forever. So the way it works now is um, it, it looks at what policies and modifiers you mm -hmm. have. You don't lose those. But as soon as you finish that item, it says that item's done and I'm not going to add any mo modifiers until I know what you're choosing next. Okay. And what you're choosing next probably doesn't have that modifier that you had just put in place from the from the policy, so you won't get that bonus. Now, it's possible you have it the other way around. And you don't have a modifier in place now, but you have something for what you're going to work on next. And so, so we don't take modifiers away, mm -hmm. but there's just this crazy acceleration that you can get from the modifiers. We, we've um, clamped down on that a okay. bit. Yeah, there's quite a few um, changes going back to base game. Um, I know last time we talked a little bit about the build queue. Um, right. Right. That should be. There are. Big... And um, <laughs> I, I know we've carefully made a list of those. Mm -hmm. So any base game players who are wondering right. right away what's in the base game or not, we'll have that all that information. Mm -hmm. Now, some of that is getting tweaked as we yeah. keep working on the game, so we don't have a final list of those yet. So, you know, we're not going to announce that yet, but... Um, we're super but we happy. Will get there. We're, we're, we'll, we will get there, and we're super happy at the support we've been able to give to all versions of the game. Yeah, excellent. Oh, I did see a great question in here. 
here is the loyalty issue. Yes. Seeing it right front and center, that kind of most of the places we have to expand, we've got this kind of disparate, disjointed settlement pattern right now. And um, now this is the kind of situation where the landmass to the east, where Hungary is, if we could get a foothold over there, that might help us out. And I think that looks like that's what Carl's next move is going to be. We haven't, ex you know, the seas didn't open up to the west. So we're not quite sure what's <laughs> over those mountain ranges. It's it's a tricky problem here for sure. I love Matthias. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's got he's got that kind of I don't know the Alexander arrogance that I mm -hmm. I, I think find it's a lot of charming. Fun. Yeah. And it makes me really just you know want to go to war, honestly. <laughs> Okay, so some people were asking, um, how does the Maori unique unit compare to like the Roman Legion? Yeah. Um, it's it's strong, and it's something you know. Mm -hmm. All those kind of things, um, people should uh, not feel like we've locked in all the balance right. decisions on that. Yeah. It's still something that we're definitely uh, looking at. Um, the the Roman Legion is nice in that um, you can go ahead and. Um, take that extra build charge you get with him, mm -hmm. and you can do whatever you want with it. You know, they're they're not shy about harvesting resources and chopping right. up things. So, I know people. A lot of people have used those, not necessarily to build Roman forts, but maybe for whatever their town nearby needs. And and you can um, um, get a, get a bit of an advantage from that as well. Um, I I find that the legion. Yeah, you know, Rome's a very different power yes. than the Maori. Rome <laughs> is so centralized and yeah. has roads connecting everything. And you can, and usually your cities are all together, mm -hmm. so you can build up a massive force of whatever your unit is. So the Roman Legion, I, I love to mass produce a bunch of them and get them running down the roads and right. off and, and attacking nearby settlements. Um, the Toa, the um, Maori unit is is pretty well equally strong, and the, mm -hmm. the fact he's got the Haka War Dance, which acts the same way the Varu Elephant mm -hmm. ability to weakens to adjacent weaken enemies, adjacent right? units, mm -hmm. that's that's very very effective as well. Now I believe I did look at this, and I think the Toa is slightly more expensive right now. Okay, but that's again something I don't want people to lot lack onto right. too much because it's it's definitely things that we're going to be looking at. Um, I feel like right now they're good at. Um, helping get the Maori presence established wherever they need to be. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think they're so strong, or at least so easy to concentrate, that they're quite as effective as the Legion as right. being sort of a big offensive force across the map. Yeah. Now, the PA is a unique, um, it has a unique visual, right? Yes, it does. What is that, what is that based on? Research that... <laughs> A lot of the edge actually yeah. fell on that one. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Okay. What, what's what's cool is th um, there are a lot of places within New Zealand mm -hmm. that they knew that the uh, Maori and the Maori had a long series of colonial wars against the British, and they were very fierce defenders of their territory. And the British had trouble displacing them, and a yeah. lot of that was because of the fortresses that they established um, in some of the hillier areas. And some of those fortresses are still there. Um, you know, there's there's a famous one called One Tree Hill um, mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, is, is just a huge hill overlooking, you know, bay and harbor and town. Yeah. And so you can go and visit those. So we wanted to represent that. We felt like that was such a cool, um, uniquely Maori uh, entity. The, the Marai, the, the unique building that they get, yeah. is something that's shared with all the other Polynesians. It's not mm -hmm. as unique to the, to the Maori, but we okay. felt like the Pa was something that they came up with, you know, as, as the way they were going to defend themselves and, and uh, keep themselves safe when they were fighting all these wars. And so we wanted to, to include that if we possibly could. Yeah. I always find it interesting how, like, I guess there's this kind of... Um, gap that we have to fill between what is left of um, much older buildings and how we want to represent that game um, in a way that's like representative of how it would look at the time. Yes. Um, but we did have the chance to do something a little different than that uh, with this expansion. You know, we've got this future era 
um, which we'll be seeing in some of the other live streams. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we don't have visuals to go with this, but because you're here, I wanted to talk a little bit about okay. you know, the future buildings, because we do have a couple additions there for your towns. Yes, especially the, the cities. And when we talked about it and talked with Ed, we didn't want to go super far into the future mm -hmm. with our, you know, our reputation in art. And we didn't want to go too gritty like in some of these, these scenes. We kind of found this sweet spot. And we looked at Singapore a lot because it's kind of already has that future vibe yeah. to it as it is. So you'll see in you know future live streams lots of lights and some like ads that are all kind of flipping over digitally. And oh, just, cool. it's yeah. a really neat look, but there's still remnants of your older civ cities there. Mm -hmm. So it kind of, I think, feels very natural. Yeah. Um, that is, I think, something that I noticed a couple of fans were a little wary of when we first started talking about, you know, future era. Um, they're like, oh, how sci-fi right. is Civ going right now? Um, but they're very, everything's based on very near future, things that like we are seeing, like happening, like research or uh, development that's actually in progress right now. Um, so it is, it is nice that the visuals kind of kept to that as well. They're really neat looking. Yeah. Um, uh, I know there was a particular cool thing. Oh my gosh, we're getting so destroyed sorry, by sorry hurricanes. hurricanes. <laughs> uh. Well, let's go to event history and double check. Yeah. So or is that just the same moving one? around out there? Yeah, we've had two category fives. Wow. They were nine turns apart, but yeah, we're a little bit hurricane alleyed here. Um, okay, so we've got a couple questions in here. Um, are the different map types, do they affect the weather in any way? Are there other things, um, map settings that affect the weather, or is that all controlled by the... It's all mostly realism? controlled by the, the disaster, natural disaster yeah. intensity setting that you choose in the beginning. Um, it, it is going to be the case that if you have a map type where you have um, a lot of a particular terrain type, that might steer you towards certain types of storms mm -hmm. or droughts, you know, because it's going to, um, uh, it also might intensify in oh, one right, area. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you play on a map that has just tons of grasslands and plains, it'll probably be, you know, uh, tornadoes and, and, um, um, the droughts yeah. that are hitting you a lot. So, um, but it's, it's not like a direct correlation that we look at the map type and we, we make major adjustments. It's right. just based on the disaster intensity setting. Okay, that's good to know. Um, so is there ever a chance if you start a game as the Maori that you can spawn in like a lake? Um, no, because okay. we, <laughs> I, the way that the ocean start sieves work is we look for the largest blocks of sea that okay, we can. Okay, great. And um, we actually set it up so that if possible, we put you in a place where you cannot see land in any direction. Because mm -hmm. I kind of, I love the decision yeah. point of, I have mm -hmm. no hint as to which idea, which direction is best. I re-rolled like, this a few times just, just to make sure there was, was no nice, land. <laughs> big, yeah. That's cool. <laughs> um, so sometimes on some maps, you know, there's just no huge body of water, but it, it's fun also to think about the fact that you can have more than one ocean going mm -hmm. sieve in a map, and uh, modders could come up with their own ideas yeah. for other sieves that should have the same kind of start. Um, you could play a game where everyone starts at sea, um, so there are all sorts of possibilities. That'd be fun. Yeah. yeah. I think we had a was that one of our cities that was having loyalty troubles yeah, back there? Yeah, having some issues. <laughs> um, so. True start locations? Yes, okay. that, they are supported in the true start location. Cool. And now that Coupe originated at a mythical island, right? Um, I believe they think it is possible that it might have been Tahiti. Um, so I think we did pick an area, at least in that part of the Pacific, for their true start location. Mm -hmm. So obviously in a true start map, you will know, you know, get used to once you play it a couple times where you are. Um, but they will again start at sea and they'll have to decide where they want to you know, head with their initial settlement. And that'll depend a lot on who else is in the true start game. So if you do a true start game with them and you randomly select who else is in the game, right. you'll have a lot of the same kind of fun exploration that you have with this one. Okay. 
Um, JJ, have you had a chance to play as the Maori yet? All the time. Oh, really? Yeah, I'm okay. playing at them today, actually. Nice. So. To prep for this. Yeah. I like, I, I, they're, they go, come in a lot of times in my, in my plays. So. Okay, cool. Are you having fun with it? Of course. Yeah, yeah they're, they're a lot of fun. Nice. Um, yeah, I just really like this whole sieve a lot. So I, I love the exploration. Part. Yeah. Who was your favorite vanilla sieve? <sighs> I played as, as China a lot. Okay. Well, yeah, that's uh, cool. I kind of was all over the place player. looking at all the art. Now I'm, I kind of hop around, but yeah. yeah. That's one of the things I love about JJ being our art director is he's one of the artists I've worked with who just plays the game over and over and over again. Yeah, every so, single day. I know. <laughs> I know you, you, you said to me one time um, a year or two back that you were really getting into religious victories yeah. over and over again. Are you still mostly going for the religious victory? I've been you, weaning myself off and I've been okay. going for science mostly lately, okay. especially with the, the new science stuff. Stuff, Ooh, you know, yes. so, science stuff. Yeah, the so. new science stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am really looking forward to some of our upcoming streams. Yeah. We're, we've I, got I like a some couple of the new culture stuff. Too. Yeah, yeah, sure. I know. <laughs> <laughs> we've got a couple new things up our sleeves that um, we haven't talked about just yet. That I think I think people are going to be pretty stoked about. Um, and one thing in terms of getting people ready for what's coming up. Um, you, you were talking before about how you know, the, the Maori have a bit of a handcuff here. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so... Oh, yeah. Um, they can't get great writers. Mm -hmm. um, Why is that? That is because it was mostly, I mean, Carl and his team kept giving us feedback over these, this whole year right. about the balance of them. And mm -hmm. we had put in a lot of cultural benefits to them mm -hmm. from the environment. And they could get tourism that way. They could get culture that way. But when they also got the regular amount of culture and tourism from everything else, it was too much. Okay. So we had to find some area to scale back, and we didn't really want to pull back on the environmental mm -hmm. part because that was giving them such a nice feel that they really wanted to preserve the environment. So we had to look for some existing area to pull back on. Right. And so we certainly didn't want to make any comments about, you know, the the traditions of the Ma the Maori, but they are mostly a a verbal tradition type of um, culture and things passed down by storytelling yeah. and so forth. So it felt better to pull out the great writers than right. sort of anything else we could come up with. Give it a little thematic element right. to it. Right, so that's why we did that. Now, um, you know, people, people have different reactions to that. Some people like those sort of wildly asymmetric sieves mm -hmm. where some things are added in a very strong way and other things are taken away. We did that with Congo, for yeah. instance, in the base game. Which um, was one of my favorite base games to right. play. So we just wanted to let people know coming up, we have <laughs> several more civilizations that are like this that we're going to be announcing. I think actually some of the next few, um, uh, yeah. I, th I think, are, are definitely this way. So we don't want people to think, oh, they did this one civ this way and they're not following this pattern at all for anyone else. Mm -hmm. There are going to be some interesting, um, you know, handcuffs, but also opportunities and right. powers and abilities that we're going to be announcing with some of the upcoming civs. Nice. And we have gone back and updated a couple of base game civs as well, right? Right. Uh, now, a lot of Nothing people are quite that drastic, I'm sure. Right. And, and I think England got probably the, you know, most mm. significant changes here. But, um, yeah, they're... they're Anytime we feel like there's something that's appropriate, um, so whether it's the blizzard's ability going to Russia yeah. or anything along those lines, um, we, we have um, a sieve that we decided that we wanted um, to give early canals to. Mm -hmm. And since China has such a history of having canals all the way back to mm -hmm. Emperor Qin's time, that's who we gave that ability to. So, oh, so that's another okay. little tidbit of just a case mm -hmm. of like, now that we have this new Gathering Storm feature, let's mm -hmm. look at how they sort of applied across yeah. all of our cultures and civilizations and figure out where bonuses make sense. Oh, that's great. Awesome. Um, we are getting close to time, but is there anything else that you guys, you know, want to bring up and talk about while you're here? Um, Maori or? It's a general thing that we changed in this one with you. Back in uh, Rise and Fall, we changed the light angle slightly just to make it feel as a new thing as you come in. And we did oh, the yeah. same thing uh, for this game when we brought the lighting actually around to the front a little more. Oh, 
kind of brighten things up mm -hmm. a little bit. So you'll get some different reads on units and buildings, and, and they look really nice in this new lighting oh, setup. Cool. And, and why don't you talk a little bit about just the whole pass that was done pretty much across the whole set of units. Yes. <gasps> yeah, I Dennis kind of brought that up last time. Did he bring right. it up? I wasn't but, sure, but, so that's why. I think yeah. it coming from Yeah, from no, JJ, definitely. That would, um, yeah, we had um, our unit, you know, we, John Fitzgerald, put a lot of time in going through all the setups and making sure that one, he did a new pass on a lot of the textures. Um, so you'll see a lot of things a little bit brighter, a little bit more details. And then we've also gone through and got all our cultural settings really nice. So like you can even see the, the, the base warriors here have yeah, a, a Maori feel to them. Can we zoom in? They, they use like the same of the same hairstyles yeah. and and I, I really think there's been a really nice overhaul visually on, on the units especially that I think people will like, so. And it's not just the human figures as well. They went through boats, they went boats, through tanks, they yep. went through airplanes. The know. tanks and mechanized stuff is really cool when we, when we show that. It's a really neat feel. Nice. Different cultures will have a little bit different color on their uh, their mechanized infantry or units and stuff. So. Super pleased with how much time we were able to spend across the whole lineup of units. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And people have been noticing that. They're like, does this guy look a little different than he did before? But <laughs> yeah, we've been, you know, I've yeah. seen that a they're few not, times. They're not misremembering. Those changes mm -hmm. are actually in there. Nice. Yeah, that's, that's really great. Oh my gosh, is that another? Yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, before we get blown away um, by all these storms, um, thank you guys so much for, you know, coming out today, um, talking to everyone and, you know, sharing your stories. Like, sure. everyone really appreciates it, I'm sure. Um, and thank you guys for coming in, sitting with us. Um, Civilization VI Gathering Storm is coming out February 14th, 2019, because we love you guys so <laughs> much. Um, so thank you again, and have a great day. Thanks. <laughs>